Hello everyone and welcome to Letchworth State Park. My name is Elijah, I'm an environmental educator here in the park and right now it's one of my absolute favorite times of the year, it's maple season. This is the time of year when we collect sap from our maple trees and turn it into yummy maple syrup. So today we're going to talk about everything involved in that process of turning clear watery maple tree sap into the sweet yummy maple syrup that we all know and love. The first thing we need to figure out though is which one of these trees out in the forest are actually maple trees. The maple trees that we are so interested in are sugar maple trees. They get that name because of all the sugar in their sap. This is a time of year when the trees don't have leaves. Many people that are new to tree identification, we'll look at the unique shaped leaves of each tree to identify the species. Unfortunately, we can't rely on looking at the leaves of our maple trees. So instead, we're going to look at the three B's of tree ID. We're going to look at the bark, the budding, and the branches. First, sugar maple trees when they get big enough for us to be able to tap, have very textured bark, sort of gray in color. If you look in a tree field guide, it will tell you the texture is very furrowed, very curly on this bark. There's our first B. The second B that we'll look at is the budding. Now, throughout the world, there are at least 500 different kinds of maple trees. The sugar maple tree's leaf buds are chocolatey brown, very pointy. So when you poke one with a bare finger, ooh, you can feel how sharp those leaf buds are. That's our second B. The final B is the branching. Most trees that grow in our forest here in Letchworth State Park have what we call alternate branching. What that means is where one twig or one branch grows out of a stem, the next branch grows off of a different location of the stem. And that's the more common branching pattern, is alternate branching. What's much less common is what we call opposite branching. There's only a few different kinds of trees that have this opposite branching pattern, where one twig or one branch grows out of the stem, there's another twig or another branch on exactly the opposite side of that same stem. The way we remember the opposite branching trees is by telling ourselves mad horse. Mad, M-A-D, stands for maple, ash, dogwood, and horse is a kind of a tree called a horse chestnut. So if we see opposite branching on a tree, we know that it has to be either a maple, an ash, a dogwood, or a horse chestnut tree. That really helps us to narrow it down. So if we put those three clues, those three B's together for this tree here, we see the, the furrowed texture, gray colored bark. We see opposite branching and chocolatey brown, sharp pointy leaf buds. That tells us this has to be a sugar maple tree. Now, all we need to do is get the sap out of this tree. The sap is hiding right underneath the bark layer. A common misconception is that when we drill a hole or tap our maple trees, we drill as far in as we can to get all the good sap from deep inside the tree. When in fact, if we drill too far, we will go beyond the sapwood layer of the tree and we won't be collecting any sap at all. So when I drill into the tree, I'm not drilling very far at all just far enough to get through the bark layer and into that soft living tissue we call the sapwood. 
Now when I'm drilling a hole in this tree, I'll angle the hole slightly downwards. That allows gravity to help sap flow out of this tap hole. Once the hole is drilled, I'm going to hammer in this spile. This acts as the spout that helps to funnel sap out of the tree. As I'm hammering in the spile, I'm listening for what we call tap, tap, tonk. I know that the spile is hammered in far enough when the sound changes ever so slightly from a tap, tap, tap to a tonk, tonk, tonk. And there it is. Now, once I have my spile hammered into the tap hole, I'll hang my bucket. This bucket collects the sap for me. And a very underrated piece of equipment is the bucket's lid that gets slid right on top. Now this lid helps to keep out moisture from rain and snow that later on I'm going to have to boil out, cook out of this sap to remove all that water. So I'm going to come back tomorrow to check on the sap that this bucket has collected for us. How much sap will there be tomorrow? That depends totally on the weather. Everything during maple season depends on the weather. Our maple season here in Letchworth State Park usually takes place between late February and early April. This is a time of year in the park where we have longer stretches of freezing cold nights and warm sunny days. And that is perfect maple season weather. During the freezing cold nights, sap is drawn back into the tree through the roots and the warm sunny days help the tree to release all of that pressure that builds up inside. And that fluctuation, bouncing back between freezing nights and warm days and freezing nights and warm days is what really helps the sap to flow out of the trees and fill our buckets. Now using buckets is not the only method of collecting maple sap. The part of Letchworth State Park that we're in right now is in Wyoming County. Wyoming County is the biggest producer of maple syrup by volume in all of New York State. There are some massive maple operations here in Wyoming County, and these bigger maple producers are more likely using a tubing line to collect maple sap. Some of these bigger producers might have tens of thousands of taps on their property. So instead of having to visit tens of thousands of buckets, all of the sap ends up in one common location. Here in Letchworth State Park, for demonstration purposes, We've set up 21 taps on our tubing line. So instead of having to visit all 21 taps, instead I just have to visit this barrel and collect sap from this one common location. So last night's weather got really cold, well below freezing, and today it's warm and sunny again. So let's see how much sap is collected inside of our bucket. All right, that is plenty of sap. So now we're gonna take the bucket off the tree and dump the sap into our collection tank. The sap, remember, is not what we're eating on our pancakes each morning. In order to turn this sap into maple syrup, we have to evaporate most of the water out, which will leave the sugar behind. So what we're left with is that sweet, yummy maple syrup that we know and love. So I'm going to bring this sap up to our sugar house so we can boil it down. Once the sap arrives here in our sugar house, we've got to pump it from the tank on the back of our vehicle to our bulk tank. Now this bulk tank holds up to 100 gallons of sap. And you can see how clear and watery that sap looks. It's still wild to think that very soon this sap will be turned into amber brown colored syrup. Sap travels through this hose and feeds what we call our float box. 
This floating piece of metal inside the float box is what regulates the liquid level. As more sap comes in from the bulk tank, the float rises, and in doing so, it plugs up the intake pipe. So we don't have to monitor ourselves how much sap is coming in once we set the float inside the float box. Once the sap leaves that initial area of the evaporator, it comes into what we call our back pan or our flue pan. The dropped flues on the bottom of this pan increase the surface area. On the bottom of the pan that's being heated, that means that this back pan heats up super hot, super quickly to begin very efficiently boiling this sap. As the sap is boiling, its density is changing. All of this steam rising up out of the pans means that we're losing water. But as the sap boils, the sugar remains. So as the sap is boiling along, it gets pushed from one chamber of each pan to the next. All that's pushing it is fresh sap filling in from behind. So as the sap moves from the float box between the two chambers in our back pan, eventually to the two chambers in our front pan, it's slowly becoming closer and closer to maple syrup until it finds its way right behind our draw-off nozzle. When we twist this handle, what pours out is pure maple syrup. Now there's at least a couple different ways to test the doneness of our maple syrup. One is by checking the temperature. We know that maple syrup boils at 219 degrees Fahrenheit. That's seven degrees hotter than the boiling point of water. So if we see a thermometer reach 219 degrees, we know we can stop cooking. We've got finished maple syrup. Another instrument we use is this glass hydrometer. We know that the density is changing as we're turning sap into syrup. As we're evaporating water out of the liquid, the sugar remains and the density increases. So to use this hydrometer, first we fill this metal cup with liquid off of the front pan of the evaporator. We gently lower our hydrometer into the hydrometer cup. It uses the higher density of the liquid in the hydrometer cup to test what's called degrees bricks, or percent sugar. The sap coming out of sugar maple trees averages about 2% sugar. Maple syrup is finished at 66% sugar. So by lowering this hydrometer into the hydrometer cup, into that higher density liquid, it will float, it will bob up and down, and depending on if we're testing our liquid hot or cold, we need one of these two red lines to be floating right at the surface of the liquid in our cup so that we know that liquid has the proper density, meaning it has the correct degrees bricks or percent sugar. But once the maple syrup comes off of the evaporator, the process is not quite finished yet. A natural byproduct of cooking maple tree sap is a solid sediment that settles out called sugar sand or niter. This sugar sand is gritty, flavorless, and not something you want to be eating on your pancakes in the morning. So once we draw syrup off the evaporator, we run it through our filter press. The filter press has a series of metal plates between each of which we would place a piece of filter paper. As the gritty syrup goes into the press, what comes out is the yummy, gooey, silky smooth maple syrup that we know and love. After the maple syrup is filtered and before it can go into a bottle, we first have to assign a grade. The maple syrup grade tells you how light or dark the syrup will be. It also tells you the intensity of maple flavor. Just a few years ago, the grading system was standardized across the board, so now all maple producers use the same maple syrup grading system. The grades go from the lightest syrup 
we call golden delicate, moving on to amber rich, then dark robust, and the darkest syrup is graded as very dark strong, having a very dark color and a strong maple flavor. In order to assign a grade to maple syrup, we use a sample of syrup that we've just filtered and we grab our maple syrup grading kit. Our sample gets slid into a compartment next to the lightest grade, Golden Delicate. If our sample is darker than Golden Delicate, we move it down the line to compare it with Amber Rich. If our sample is darker than Amber Rich, it moves down the line one more time. We compare it with Dark Robust. If our sample ends up being darker than dark, it's simply graded as very dark strong. There's nothing that maple producers are doing differently throughout the maple season to end up with different grades of maple syrup. Typically, the maple season starts with producers bottling very light syrup, and the season ends with producers bottling very dark syrup. Once we assign a grade to the maple syrup, it's ready to be bottled. Our maple sugaring process here in Letchworth State Park is a more modern, albeit small scale operation. But the wonderful thing about making maple syrup is there's really no one way right or wrong to do it. In fact, maple syrup and maple sugar has been made for hundreds, if not thousands of years here in North America and maple has a very interesting history. The native people of North America were the first humans to turn maple tree sap into maple syrup or maple sugar. To do so, the Abenaki people, or more local to us, the Seneca, would be collecting the sap from maple trees and stone boiling in wooden or clay pots. For stone boiling, they would heat up rocks in a hot, hot fire and drop those hot rocks into the cold sap, let the rock sizzle. The steam is water vapor leaving the sap, just in the same way that we saw water vapor leaving the sap on our evaporator pans. Eventually, when European settlers came to North America, they learned the ways of turning maple tree sap into syrup or sugar and they used metal pots that they were bringing from Europe to cook that sap over an open fire. By the time of the birth of this nation, the United States of America, many early abolitionists, including some of this nation's founding fathers, were big proponents of the maple industry for a couple different reasons. One, at that time, sugar from sugarcane was being imported from the British West Indies. So in order to wean this young nation's dependence off of British imports, maple sugar was offered as a viable substitute. But also those early abolitionists recognized much of the sugarcane in the West Indies was being harvested by slaves. So as a way to start to try to wean the United States of America off of slavery, early abolitionists were promoting the maple industry so that self-sustaining small family farms throughout this young nation would be able to survive without relying on slave labor. This process of turning maple sap into maple syrup that's been done for hundreds if not thousands of years is currently under threat due to climate change. According to a study published in the Journal of Forest Ecology and Management, as the climate warms, the native growing range of sugar maple trees will shrink and move slowly northward. At the same time, the range of peak maple syrup production will also move further north as the climate warms, further into Canada. The sugar content of the sap may slowly decrease, which means 
more sap will be needed to make maple syrup. Climate change also allows several different invasive pests from Asia to survive in our northern North American climates. One such invasive insect is the spotted lanternfly. The spotted lanternfly is what we call a generalist, meaning it eats a wide variety of foods. Many of the foods that it eats and could possibly destroy includes lots of different agricultural crops, including maple trees. So as the climate changes and the trees are stressed due to the warming climate, there's added stress from invasive species like spotted lanternfly. If you see spotted lanternfly or signs of its existence anywhere in New York State, be sure to contact the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. The great thing about maple is there's not just one way to make maple syrup. So long as you have a way to collect the sap and cook it down, you can do this at home, even on your kitchen stove. All you need is to live in a place that has maple trees growing, where the nights are freezing and the days are warm by late winter or early springtime. If you're thinking about making maple syrup at home, or if you just want to purchase some New York State pure maple syrup, be sure to check out nysmaple.com. It's a phenomenal resource for all things New York maple. And be sure to always insist on pure New York State maple.